second and third commandments. Let's look first at the second commandment. The second commandment reads, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything. And then it goes on and at another point it says, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. So the commandment itself is a lot longer than that. You can read that in Exodus 20. But the positive, remember we mentioned that all of the commandments imply both a positive command and a negative prohibition. So even though this is a you shall not, let's look at what is positively required here. The positive is that we are to worship God the way he is commanded. We are to give him true worship. Notice the focus on in this commandment on worship. It says you are not to bow down to them or serve them. That's worship language. So the focus of the second commandment here is worship. We are to worship God in the way he has commanded, the way he has told us. So then the flip side of that is don't worship God in ways other than what he has commanded. Don't use images. That's what he's talking about. We don't imagine ways to worship God. We don't come up with ways or we don't follow traditions just because they are traditions. Okay, so we don't imagine ways to worship. Now, this leads then to the concept in Reformed theology of the regulative principle of worship. This is, worship is governed by the Word of God. Now, sometimes this concept of the regulative principle of worship has been made into a slogan. That is, we say, whatever is not commanded is forbidden. And we contrast this with, for example, Lutherans and Episcopalians who might say that whatever is not forbidden is allowed. And see, the thing is, though, we have to watch out for slogans like this. If we say whatever is not commanded is forbidden. Because, you see, God teaches us in other ways besides just commands. Uh, there are biblical examples. There are biblical principles involved. And so we have to be careful about this slogan. Instead, I think we would say that we need to have biblical warrant for all we do in worship. Whatever we do in worship needs to be based upon Scripture. And that's not just the New Testament. You see, we use the whole Bible. Remember we said earlier, we're not just New Testament Christians, we are whole Bible Christians. Now, the New Testament teaches us that there are some parts of Old Testament worship that we no longer carry out in the same way. For example, sacrifice. Although I've mentioned that we still do bring sacrifice to the Lord. It's just that the sacrifice we bring is the once for all sacrifice of Christ. But we no longer bring animals to worship okay, and sacrifice them in worship. So there is a change. But other things that were done in the Old Testament continue. The Old Testament worship had prayers. And so we continue offering prayers. Okay. We don't just say that all of the Old Testament worship is abolished and we have nothing to do with it anymore. Instead, we view it in light of the New Testament. But you see, this helps us because then we can get an idea from the Old Testament what is pleasing to God in worship. And we can get an idea of how he understood these commandments. For example, God commanded Moses in the tabernacle to make pictures and carvings. There were palm trees. There were the cherubim. There were items, there were pictures and carvings and images of things in the tabernacle. And this is from the same God who gave us the second commandment. So this must mean that images and pictures are not themselves contrary to the second commandment. They are not in opposition to the second commandment. Now, we can't worship those things. The people of Israel were not to bow down and worship those pictures and those images. But it was okay to have them in the worship center. In fact, God commanded it. And I don't think there would be a similar problem or a problem with similar types of pictures in our worship centers. You can have a picture as long as you're not worshiping it. But now, that brings us to another example. Pictures of Jesus. 
a problem area. Now, I'll make it plain right up front. This is an area where I disagree with the Westminster Confession of Faith. And when I was an elder in our church, I told the session that this was an area of disagreement. So, you know, I want to make that plain. Okay, this is something different than the Westminster Confession. But I want to make it clear what we are not talking about, what I'm not talking about here with pictures of Jesus. This is not a question about whether it's all right to have a picture of Jesus as a center of worship, as something we bow down to or direct prayers to. I was recently watching a rerun of the old Good Times TV show, and the family was in financial trouble, as they often were, and the mother in the show had a picture of Jesus hanging in the apartment. And at a crucial point in the show, she went to that picture and she prayed to that picture. She prayed to Jesus through that picture. Now, I don't believe that's proper. It's not proper to direct worship, to direct prayers, to images, to pictures. That's precisely what the second commandment forbids. So that is not what I'm talking about here, though, when I say is it appropriate to have pictures of Jesus. The question here I'm looking at is, especially for us in education, may we use pictures of Jesus for educational purposes? For example, my wife taught kindergarten for many years, and she used flannel graph pictures to teach Bible stories. Was it acceptable for her to use a flannel graph picture of Jesus? To tell stories in the Gospels. Or let's say one of the activities is to have a child drawing a picture of a Bible story. Is it all right for that child to draw a picture of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead? Or should he be told to leave Jesus out of the picture? Or as one child I taught did, would just draw a glowing light in place of Jesus? Now, the Westminster Larger Catechism, when it deals with the Second Commandment, says this. It says that the Second Commandment forbids making any representation of any of the three persons, that is, the Father, Son, or Holy Spirit, any of the three persons, either inwardly in our mind or outwardly in any kind of image. So the Westminster Standards say we must not make any picture of Jesus or the Father or the Holy Spirit at all, not even in our mind. Now there's some problems with this approach. First, it's impossible to avoid mental images. When I tell you a story about anyone or anything, you tend to visualize it. I mean, that was one of the benefits of the old radio dramas. People used their imagination to picture Superman or Dick Tracy or whatever. When we hear stories, we get a mental picture of what's going on. So, the preacher tells the story of Jesus turning the water into wine. You probably imagine a wedding scene, people partying, there's jars of wine over here, here's the master of ceremonies, here's the bride and groom, here's Jesus' disciples and his mother. Now, do you just imagine a blank space or a bright light where Jesus would be? Probably not. You get a mental scene of a man talking to the servants, telling them to fill the pots with water, that type of thing. Now, I would agree with the Westminster Confession as far as worship is concerned here. We must not, as part of worship, sit down and visualize Jesus as a distinct part of worship. You know, have somebody say, okay, now close your eyes and imagine Jesus reaching out his arms to you in love. Picture him there, those hands with the nail holes. Okay, I don't believe that's appropriate. But you see, the Westminster Confession would seem to prohibit even incidental images in our minds. But more importantly here is that the Second Commandment is focused on worship, as I already mentioned, not on pictures themselves. Notice that the commandment doesn't actually mention images of God. It prohibits images of anything in heaven, which could include God, but more likely refers to heavenly bodies, anything on earth or under the earth. Now, if you take that at face value, that would prohibit all pictures of anything at any time for any purpose. But you see, the commandment goes on to explain it's dealing with worship. You shall not bow down. 
So the prohibition isn't dealing with the picture or the image, it's dealing with worshiping God by means of a picture or image. Think about it logically. If the second commandment prohibits all pictures of Jesus, then it prohibits all pictures of anything. The language is all-inclusive. I can't have a picture of a tree, of a cat, my wife, the moon, or anything else. But you might say, oh, well, that's not the problem. We're not to use these to worship God. Precisely. So if I have a picture of Jesus and I'm not worshiping God by means of it, then I'm okay. But then people will say, no, the second commandment prohibits pictures of Jesus. You see, I, I don't see that. The commandment prohibits all pictures of everything. Now, another way to think about it. If we were one of J Jesus' disciples when we were on earth, when he was here on earth, and if we had a camera, we could have taken a picture of Jesus and he would have shown up on the picture. He was a real person. I don't believe it would have destroyed the camera. I don't believe it would have overexposed the film. I don't think it would have shown up as a blank space or a bright light on the picture. You see, Jesus had a real body, just like you and I. If I could have taken picture, a picture of Paul, I could have taken a picture of Jesus. You see, there was a heresy in the early church called docetism. This said that Jesus didn't have a real body because physical things are sinful. Jesus only appeared to have a body. He didn't really have one. See, the resurrection denies this. Jesus told his disciples to touch him. He ate food and so on to show that he had a real body. The idea that we could not make a picture of Jesus implies that Jesus maybe didn't have a real body since he was God. Now, I'll grant you, we don't know what Jesus looked like, but we don't know what any Bible character looked like, and we don't have a problem with making pictures of them. We have to be careful that we don't misrepresent Jesus' character. You know, don't have a picture that makes him look like a wimp or makes him look like a blue-eyed blonde like the old Precious Moments characters used to do. Now, we have to be careful here. I will say that. We have to be careful. Our sinful human hearts tends to want to worship idols. John Calvin said that our hearts are idol factories. I don't believe we should have pictures of Jesus anywhere in our worship center, even if they're not front and center, because we may tend to start showing undue reverence to the picture. But educational uses like Sunday school and kindergarten are not a problem. Now again, I remind you this is different from the Westminster Confession, so I want to be sure not to encourage you to violate those standards. So now, let's look at the third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. The positive aspect here is to use God's name properly. You see, that word take literally means to wear. The name in a Bible isn't just a label. It refers to his character, to his attributes. So we are to speak properly of God's character, of his attributes. We wear his name in the right way. We live in a way that properly reflects God's name on us. After all, we are called Christians, Christ followers. So this isn't just a matter of our speech. It includes our speech, but it also includes our whole lives. Our whole lives are to reflect the name, the character of God. In a negative sense, we don't trivialize God's name. We don't take it in vain. That's what it means. This would include things like minced oaths, where instead of saying God's name, instead of saying God, we say gosh, things like that, or trivial cursing. Uh, if you're going to pronounce a curse, if you're going to say God damn you, that should mean something. It's not just a trivial thing. Now, question here. What about the use of foul language in literature and in drama? Or is it wrong to read books or watch movies that have profanities, obscenities, or blasphemies? If I'm an author or a screenwriter, is it wrong for me to write those in my books as something a character might say? Or if I'm an actor, is it alright for me to say those words in a play or a movie? Now, 
Think about the simple fact of honesty. If I'm reading a book about men in the trenches in war, I know they are not saying, Well, shazam, I just got shot in the leg. That wouldn't be an accurate portrayal of war. Similarly, for other portrayals of sin, and remember, good literature is based on some type of conflict which is going to involve sin in some way. Movies are the same way. This goes for whether I'm reading or writing it. Now, I do think a Christian author can use moderation and not have every other word a curse word. But it's simply not accurate to have all the characters avoiding profanity. And by the way, this also follows biblical example. I mean, Paul in Philippians 3, when he speaks about his former life as an unbeliever, he uses very strong language. When he looks back on his life, he calls it a pile of dung. And the word is actually much stronger. It's more akin to if he said it was a pile of SH. Okay. There's also the fact that Rabshakeh in 2 Kings 18, the pagan commander, uttered blasphemy against the Lord. That blasphemy is recorded in the Bible. He blasphemously said that the Lord is no better than the gods of the land who had already been destroyed. Or even Paul. In 1 Corinthians 12, 3, Paul writes, Jesus is cursed. Now, in the context, he was saying, if you're governed by the Holy Spirit, you cannot say that. But the mere act of writing those words or saying them is not in itself wrong because the Bible does so. Again, we see the context in each case. I mean, Rabshakeh is a wicked man. Paul is saying that those who blaspheme Jesus are not led by the Spirit. But we still have to say it cannot be wrong to write or to utter those words at all since the Bible does so. Here's where it's helpful to remember our discussion about the situation in ethics. One person says, Jesus is cursed and is guilty of blasphemy. Another person says, Jesus is cursed and is guiltless because of the situation he says it in, or the purpose, a goal he has. When we talk about foul language in books and movies, we need to think about the situation. For example, the maturity of the reader or hearer. A young teenage boy reading profanities can't handle it without deciding he wants to imitate it while an adult can read it and know he shouldn't imitate it. And the Bible teaches this idea of maturity. It says strong meat is for the mature, milk is for the immature. Now, here's how I view this. We always use a passage, Philippians 4.8, whatever is true, whatever is pure, and so on, think on these things. We use that passage a lot in this context. And people will say, well, that shows this book or this movie has some profanities in it and we shouldn't watch it because we're only to put what's good and true in our minds. But notice what Paul says. He doesn't say, don't let these things enter your minds. He says, don't meditate on them. That is, don't let them roll around in your mind. Don't let them take over your mind. Don't let them fill your mind. Don't focus on them. If you watch a movie that has some profanity in it and you find that all you think about is that profanity and you're tempted to use it yourself, then don't watch the movie. If you watch it and your focus is on the overall story, then it's not a problem. There's another verse that I think applies here, Matthew 15:17 to 20, where Jesus said that it was not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out from the heart. Now, Jesus was talking about ceremonial washings, but his, he was saying that those things going into us don't make us defiled or unclean. It's those things that come out of our heart. Our sinful heart is what twists things and makes them sinful and defiles us. In the context we're talking about, I would say that the words going into our minds are not sinful. What's sinful is if we meditate on them and then express ourselves sinfully. Let me give you a mundane example of the three boys that I've raised. When our boys were growing up, we had a Three Stooges video. Our older two boys, Ben and Jonathan, would watch that with me, and we would laugh at the Three Stooges. Our youngest son, David, watched it, and he would imitate it. He started going around poking his brothers in the eye and trying to hit them on the head, that type of thing. So. 
we had to put that video away. We couldn't let him watch it. The video wasn't wrong. It was what David's little sinful heart did with it that was wrong. So, what I would say is, if reading or watching sinful speech causes you to sin or overtakes your mind, then avoid it. If it doesn't lead you to sin, it's not wrong in itself. Of course, don't put yourself in situations where you're tempting yourself or tempting God to keep you from sin. And this will vary by age and maturity. For example, in a school, there might be books that you allow your high school seniors to read that you don't read with the freshmen because the freshmen will just be titillated by it while the seniors can read it in, with maturity without falling into sin. Now, in our next video, we're going to be looking at the fourth and fifth commandments. And as we do, before we do, I'd like for you to think about these questions. What do you do if your job requires you to work on Sundays? And another question. Is it okay to drive faster than the speed limit on the interstates in Atlanta? We'll talk about these in the context of the fourth and fifth commandments.